In a little district west of Washington Square, the streets have run crazy and broken themselves into small strips called places. These places make strange angles and curves. One street crosses itself a time or two. Dot dot an artist once discovered a valuable possibility in this street. Suppose a collector with a bill for paints, paper, and canvas should, in traversing this route, suddenly meet himself, coming back, without a cent having been paid, on account. So, to quaint old Greenwich Village the art, people soon came prowling, hunting for north, windows and 18th century gables and Dutch attics and low rents. Then they imported some pewter mugs and a chafing dish or two from 6th Avenue and became a colony. At the top of a squatty, three-story brick, Sue and Johnsy had their studio. Johnsy was familiar for Joanna. One was from Maine, the other from California. They had met at the table de thé of an eighth street Delmonico's and found their tastes in art chicory salad, and bishop sleeves so congenial that the joint studio resulted, that was in May, in November a cold, unseen stranger, whom the doctors called pneumonia, stalked about the colony, touching one here and there with his icy fingers. Over, on the east side this ravager strode boldly, smitting his victims by scores, but his feet trod slowly through the maze of the narrow and moss-grown double quotes places dot 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 mr pneumonia was not what you would call a chivalric old gentleman a mite of a little woman with blood thin by california zephyrs was hardly fair game for the red fisted short breathed old duffer but johnsy he smote and she lay scarcely moving on her painted iron bedstead looking through the small dutch window panes at the blank side of the next brick house. One morning, the busy doctor invited Sue into the hallway with a shaggy, gray eyebrow. She has one chance and let us say ten, he said, as he shook down the mercury in his clinical thermometer. And that chance is for her to want to live. This way people have of lining you on the side of the undertaker makes the entire pharmacopoeia look silly. Your little lady has made up her mind that She's not going to get well. Has she anything on her mind? She she wanted to paint the Bay of Naples someday, said Sue. Paint? Bosh. Has she anything on her mind worth thinking twice? A man, for instance? A man? Said Sue, with a Jew's harp twang in her voice. Is a man worth? But no, doctor. There is nothing of the kind. Well, it is the weakness then, said the doctor, I will do all that science, so far as it may, filter through my efforts, can accomplish. But whenever my patient begins to count the carriages in her funeral procession, I subtract 50% from the curative power of medicines. If you will get her to ask one question about the new winter styles and cloak sleeves, I will promise you a one in five chance for her instead of one in ten. After the doctor had gone Sue went into the workroom and cried a Japanese napkin to a pulp. And she swaggered into Johnsy's room with her drawing board, whistling, ragtime. Johnsy lay, scarcely making a ripple, under the bedclothes, with her face toward the window. Sue stopped whistling, thinking she was asleep. She arranged her board and began a pen and ink drawing to illustrate a magazine story. Young artists must pave their way to art by drawing pictures for magazine stories that young authors write to pave their way to literature. As Sue was sketching a pair of elegant horse show riding trousers and a monocle of the figure of the hero and Idaho cowboy, she heard a low sound, several times repeated. She went quickly to the bedside. Johnsy's eyes were open wide. She was looking out the window and counting, counting backward. Twelve, she said, and little, later, eleven, and then, ten, and nine, and then, eight, and seven, almost together, Sue look, solicitously out of the, window, what was there to, count, there was only a, bare, dreary yard to be seen, the blank side of the brick house, twenty, feet away, dot dot an old, old ivy vine gnarled and decayed at, the roots, climbed halfway up the brick wall, 
The cold breath of autumn had stricken its leaves from the vine until its skeleton branches clung almost bare to the crumbling bricks. What is it, dear? asked Sue. Six, said Johnsy in almost a whisper. They're falling faster now. Three days ago, there were almost a hundred. It made my head ache to count them. But now, it's easy. There goes another one. There are only five left now. Five what, dear? Tell your sooty leaves on the ivy vine. When the last one falls, I must go too. I've known that for three days. Didn't the doctor tell you? Oh, I never heard of such nonsense, complained Sue with magnificent scorn. What have old ivy leaves to do with your getting well? You used to love that vine, so, you naughty girl, don't be a goosey. Why? The doctor told me this morning that your chances for getting well real soon were let's see exactly what he said. He said the chances were 10 to 1. Why, that's almost as good a chance as we have in New York when we ride on the streetcars or walk past a new building. Try to take some broth now and let Sudi go back to her drawing so she can sell the editor man with it and buy port wine for her sick child and pork chops for her greedy self. You needn't get any more wine, said John C. Keeping her eyes fixed out the window, there goes another. No, I don't want any broth. That leaves just four. I want to see the last one fall before it gets dark. Then I'll go too. Johnsy dear, said Sue, bending over her, Will, you promise me to keep your eyes closed and not look out the window until I am done working? I must hand those drawings in by tomorrow. I need the light or I would draw the shade down. Couldn't you draw in the other room? asked Johnsy coldly. I, I'd rather be here by you, said Sue. Beside, I don't want you to keep looking at those silly ivy leaves. Tell me as soon as you have finished, said Johnsy, closing her eyes and lying white and still as fallen statue. Because I want to see the last one fall. I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of thinking. I want to turn loose my hold on everything and go sailing down, down, just like one of those poor, tired leaves. Try to sleep, said Sue. I must call Behrman up to be my model for the old hermit miner. I'll not be gone a minute, don't try to move, till I come back. Old Behrman was a painter, who lived on the ground floor beneath them, he was past sixty, and had a Michelangelo's Moses beard curling, down from the head of a satyr along with the, the body of an imp. Behrman was a failure in art, forty years he had wielded the brush without getting near enough to touch. The hem of his mistress's robe. He had been always about to paint a masterpiece, but had never yet begun it. For several years he had painted nothing except now and then a daub in the line of commerce or advertising. He earned a little by serving as a model to those young artists in the colony who could not pay the price of a professional. He drank gin to excess and still talked of his coming masterpiece. For the rest, he was a fierce little old man, who scoffed terribly at softness in anyone, and who regarded himself as a special mastiff in waiting to protect the two young artists in the studio above. Sue found Behrman smelling strongly of juniper berries in his dimly lighted den below. Dot dot in one corner was a blank canvas on an easel that had been waiting there for twenty-five years to receive the first line of the masterpiece. She told him of Johnsy's fancy, and how she feared she would, indeed, light, and fragile as a leaf herself, float away, when, her slight hold upon the world grew weaker, old Behrman, with his red eyes, plainly streaming, shouted his anger over, such an idea, what, he cried, are there such fools, do people die because leaves drop off a tree, I have not heard of such a thing, no, I will not, come up and sit while you make a picture of, me, why do you allow her to think such a thing? That poor little Johnsy, she is very sick and weak, said Sue. The sickness has put these strange ideas into her mind. Dotdotum are Behrman, if you won't come, you won't. But I don't think you're very nice. This is like a woman, shouted Behrman, who said I will not come. 
Go. I come with you. For half an hour I have been trying to say that I will come. God. This is not any place for someone so good. As Johnsy to lie sick, someday shall paint my masterpiece and we shall all go away from here. God. Yes. Johnsy was sleeping when they went up. Sue covered the window and took Behrman into the other room. There they looked out the window fearfully at the tree. Then they looked at each other for a moment without speaking. A cold rain was falling with a little snow in it too. Behrman sat down and Sue began to paint. She worked through most of the night dot 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 in the morning. After an hour's sleep, she went to Johnsy's bedside. Johnsy with wide open eyes was looking toward the window. I want to see, she told Sue. Sue took the cover from the window, but after the beating rain and the wild wind that had not stopped through the whole night, there still was one leaf to be seen against the wall. It was the last on the tree. It was still dark, green near the branch, but at the edges it was turning yellow with age. There it was, hanging from a branch nearly twenty feet above the ground, near the branch. But at the edges, it was turning yellow with age. There it was hanging from a branch nearly 20 feet above the ground. It is the last one, said Johnsy. I thought it would surely fall during the night. I heard the wind. It will fall today, and I shall die at the same time. Dear, dear Johnsy, said Sue, think of me if you won't think of yourself. What would I do? But Johnsy did not answer. The most lonely thing in the world is a soul when it is preparing to go on its far journey. The tea eyes that held her to friendship and to earth were breaking, one by one. The day slowly passed. As it grew dark, they could still see the leaf hanging from its branch against the wall. And then, as the night came, the north wind began again to blow. The rain still beat against the windows. When it was light enough the next morning, Johnsy again commanded that she be allowed to see. The leaf was still there. Johnsy lay for a long time looking at it. And then she called to Sue, who was cooking, something for her to eat. I've been a bad girl, Sue, said Johnsy. Something has made that last leaf stay there to show me how bad I was. It is wrong. I want to die. I'll try to eat now, but first. Bring me a looking glass, so that I can see, myself, and then I'll sit up and watch you, cook. Double quotes. A an hour later she said, Sue, someday I hope, to paint the Bay of Naples. The doctor came in the afternoon. Sue, followed him into the hall outside Johnsy's. Room to talk to him, the chances are good, said the doctor. He took Sue's thin, shacking hand in his, give her good care, and she'll get well. And, now I must see another sick person in this house. His name is Behrman, a painter, I believe. Pneumonia, too. Mike is an old, weak man, and he is very ill. There is no hope for him, but we take him to the hospital. Today, we'll make it as easy for him as we can. The next day, the doctor said to Sue, she's safe. You have done it. Food and care now. That's all. And that afternoon Sue came to the bed, where Johnsy lay. She put one arm around her. I have something to tell you, she said. Mr. Behrman died of pneumonia today in the hospital. He was ill only two days. Someone found him. On the morning of the first day, in his room, he was helpless with pain. His shoes and his clothes were wet and as cold as ice. Everyone wondered where he had been. The night had been so cold and wild. And then they found some things. There was a light that he had taken outside. And there were his materials for painting. There was paint, green paint, and yellow paint. And look out the window, dear, at the last leaf on the wall. Didn't you wonder why it never moved when the wind was blowing? Oh, and here, it is Behrman's great. Masterpiece, he painted it there the night that the last leaf fell.